Hey guys, welcome back to the YouTube channel. Today I'm going to be going over our weathering, erosion, and deposition notes. To start off with, I wanted to talk a little bit about soil um, and the different horizons of soil. At the very top, like what we walk on, is going to be called the topsoil, and uh, it's going to be rich in biotic things. So we call that humus. So that could be plants, it could be dead plants, animal, dead animal, bugs. All of that stuff is going to be in the topsoil. And as I dig down deeper, I'm going to have less biotic stuff, more abiotic stuff. Uh, so soil, rocks, things like that. And if I dig down deep enough, I will eventually reach the bedrock. The bedrock can hold water there because it's impermeable. So we can have aquifers above the bedrock. Sometimes we even have aquifers below the bedrock. Um, it just depends. And we'll talk a little bit more about aquifers when... Uh, we do the water cycle. This is a really easy way of remembering the difference between these three words. Some people think that weathering and erosion mean the same thing and that is not true. So weathering is when rocks actually break or a landform breaks. Uh, erosion is when pieces move like we're talking rocks or sediment moves. Uh, that's erosion, so that's what we say it takes it, like it's taking it somewhere like a river is taking it or wind is taking it. And then deposition makes it. Deposition is whenever that stuff gets dropped off. And the reason we say makes it is because it's going to form something new. Like if it's dropped off at the mouth of a river, it's making a delta, or it's going to make a sand dune, it's going to make another landform. So we've got two types of weathering. Weathering is the breakdown uh, of rock, and it's kind of like remember we talked about physical and chemical changes a long time ago well then we have chemical and physical weathering except instead of calling it physical weathering we call it mechanical weathering because it's going to be all about movement so mechanical weathering is when a rock breaks but the chemical composition of the rock is not changing so it's just a physical change and there's going to be things that are moving it that are making it break apart so on your green papers, this is what I want you to write at the very top. And then one by one, we're going to be going through these five examples down here. So ice wedging is when water goes into cracks of rock and then it freezes. And when water freezes, it takes up more space. It expands. So you may have noticed this when you try to freeze a bottle of water and then you try to set it down on the counter and it won't stand up uh, because the bottom's kind of all warped. And that's because it kind of blew out the bottom of your water bottle when it was freezing. So you're supposed to pour a little bit out before you freeze it so it doesn't change the shape of your water bottle. Uh, so when this is happening in, in the cracks of rock, it breaks the rock even more. Um, so that's called ice wedging. Abrasion is wind. Um, if you've ever been out in the wind and the dirt hits your face and it kind of hurts sometimes, like it stings, that's abrasion. Abrasion is just a fancy word for scraping. So when the wind picks up little bits of sand or, or sediment and blows it against a landform, it can weather that landform. Gravity is when stuff falls. So if it falls and it breaks, that's gravitational weathering. And then plant roots can also be strong enough to break rock. Um, so this is called root wedging. So remember, wedging means when it goes between something. Um, and so roots can also do it kind of like uh, the, the water breaks apart the, the rock uh, in ice wedging. Uh, you are going to be sending me a picture of this through social media. And this is a really good example that you might be able to find out in the world. Um, of weathering, right? You can also send me a picture of erosion or deposition. Animals will also uh, break stuff, like think about your dog in your backyard digging. It can break rock as it goes. Even insects can break rock as they dig or burrow. Then we have chemical we weathering. This is going to be as a result of a chemical change. So there's a reaction that's happening here. Um, Water, acids, oxidation, and even lichens, like a uh, primary succession, can chemically weather rock. So water is really powerful. It can also, we could have also included water in our mechanical weathering, because like in a river, you know, you find those really, really smooth rocks, and we know that those have been smoothed because water's been running over them over time. 
Um, but I included water in our, our chemi on our chemical side because it can dissolve things. And a really good example of water dissolving is limestone, and that's how caves are form formed. Uh, so the limestone um, is very permeable, so water goes through it and water dissolves it as it's passing through it, and then it reaches the ceiling of a cave, and sometimes it can leave bits of the limestone that it's weathered behind on the ceiling, and it makes stalactites at the top of the ceiling, or it can drip down and bring those uh, little bits of limestone with it, and it piles it up on the cave floor, and it makes stalagmites that are growing up on the cave floor. And so this can take thousands of, million year, of years, millions of years to form. It just depends on how much water we have going through there. If there's a lot more water, then it doesn't take as long to form, but if there's not very much water, it can take a lot longer for these stalactites and these stalagmites to form. So here's an example. This could be you standing there. Um, or me, and then we have the cave underneath us. And so you can see how the water would go through, down through the limestone and form those stalactites and the stalagmites. Acid rain is not something we see around here, but it can be prevalent in other areas. And the acid and the rain um, can break down rock. This is really obvious in statues and stuff that are kind of in the shape of something specific. We can tell that the shape has changed, um, but that's a chemical breakdown of the rock. And then oxidation is rust. Anytime we see a red rock or red soil, it's because there's iron in it and it's rusting. And so that's uh, the chemical breakdown of the rock as well. And finally, lichens. Lichens, um, like we talked about during primary succession, are a little bit acidic. Um, or they have these enzymes that can break down rock and start turning it into soil uh, because there is no soil, remember, in uh, primary succession. Erosion. So now let's talk about erosion. Erosion is when um, the sediment moves. So this might be a little harder to take a picture of, um, but uh, basically it's like, you know, wind or water is going to be moving this, the, the sediment. Uh, so a river would be a really good idea. If it rains, you know, you could take a picture of that. If there's somewhere near your house where maybe there's a construction zone and you see stuff going out into the street when it rains, that would be a good example of erosion. Uh, here's some pictures of a delta. So um, this is technically de deposition also. Um, erosion is when the sediment is moving down river, um, but along with that, sediment comes nutrients and it all gets dropped off at the delta because remember we talked about how a river loses its power once it gets to the ocean so it can't carry sediment anymore so it drops it off there at the delta and it's dropping off those nutrients too so deltas are going to be really nutrient rich so plants are going to grow and uh, then that means there's lots of photosynthesis so then fish are going to be there to eat it eat the fit eat the plants I mean and then birds will be there to eat the fish and everything um, so deltas are, are very uh, cool ecosystems. Here's another example. Uh, this is just kind of the difference between erosion and, and deposition. So as the sediment comes down the river, that's erosion. And then when it gets dropped off at the delta, that's deposition. I wanted to mention really quick the Dust Bowl. Uh, so this is an example of deflation. Deflation is when there's a huge movement of sediment by wind um, due to poor farming practices. Unless, uh, in, in other words, they were like not taking care of the soil. Um, they, they weren't able to grow anything. Now this is back in like the thirties um, during the depression, uh, stuff stopped growing because they were overusing the soil. They weren't returning nutrients to the soil. And then there was also a drought. And so they weren't able to grow any crops and these windstorms would come through and it moved all the sediment. Uh, so we call that the dust bowl. Uh, so there's um, a few pictures here. You, you can see that, that uh, deflation happening, that large movement of sediment. Glaciers, which are really cool, is another example of erosion. So I have a super cool little animation I made here. You can have this happen in a valley and it fills up with snow and fills up with snow and fills up with snow and it kind of gets really, really heavy and it doesn't get cold, uh, warm enough for it to melt. And so it kind of gets compacted 
and it turns into solid ice and it starts to slide down between the valley and grow, 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 grow. And as it's growing, it's scraping along the valley walls and moving sediment. Um, and then after a while, the, it starts to melt, like nowadays they're melting, and it leaves behind these moraines that are deposited. So here's an example. As you go down the picture to the bottom, the moraine grows and grows and grows as the glacier is pushing it along, pushing along that sediment, and then it melts and it leaves it behind and there's our moraine. Here's another example of a moraine. You can see it down at the bottom. It can tell you how big the glacier used to be. Here are just a couple of pictures. So deposition is when stuff gets dropped off. Uh, and the way that I remember this is I think of when you go to the bank, you make a deposit, you're, de you're dropping off um, something, right? You're dropping off money. So that's what happens with deposition. You're dropping off the sediment. Uh, I'm going to try to find one of these. Uh, it's called a bird seed bell. They sell them at Lowe's. Last year I had a really hard time finding one. Um, but we can weather it and we call it Mount Maverick and we break off the little pieces of it every day and then um, we deposit the little pieces and we see how much we can weather down Mount Maverick. So how can we affect weathering erosion and deposition and how can it affect the environment? Soil conservation. We don't really have this problem here in Texas because it's really flat and we have lots of land, but in areas like Japan and China, they have to do um, contour plowing, which means when they plant their crops, they have to be really careful what direction they, they put the, the rows in because they want to conserve their soil. Um, so they, the, the rows are always perpendicular to the slope. Um, so that way when it rains, the, the crop catches the, the water there. It's not going to basically, you know, the rows aren't going with the slope so that all the soil gets washed away. We don't want that to happen. Um, another word that I wanted you to know that affects us, right, is subsidence, which is just basically a sinkhole or a cave-in. Uh, this is happening a lot. That happens a lot in Florida uh, just because of the, the topography and the soil there. Um, we see this happening also with fracking. Uh, we pump out oil and then there's nothing taking up that space. And so we have these um, cave-ins or the subsidence and that can cause earthquakes. There's earthquakes happening in Oklahoma, which is not, you know, it's, it's in the middle of a plate. Um, and, and that's because of subsidence that they're, they're having earthquakes. Uh, landslides can happen because of deforestation. Uh, last year, you may have heard a lot about the fires that happened in California, and then they had mudslides right after that. And what happened was there was drought, so the forest was really, really dry, and then it caught fire, and so everything caught on fire. And then soon after that, it started raining. And because there wasn't any vegetation holding the soil together with its roots because the roots act like um you know a cage over it or a skeleton over it um the the rain just kind of washed away all those the soil and there were these huge mudslides that buried people's houses and and stuff and so deforestation can also cause that too if, if they cut down the trees and then there's a you know a large rain event um, it can wash away uh, the soil. So we need to make sure that we have vegetation there uh, whose roots are holding the soil together. My sister is going to talk to you a little bit about this. Um, uh, rivers carry sediment and nutrients with them and the building of dams can inhibit that and that means that the sediment and the nutrients aren't going to the, the ecosystems further down river and so that can affect the health of them. This is what I need you to put or glue into your journal. So feel free to pause here um, and I'll show you the next slide also. And these are landforms. You need to know landforms and how they formed and what's gonna happen to them in the future. Um, and then after that, we'll get into ecoregions. Here is the second page. So make sure that you pause here and glue in all of these bits two and write in the very last one because it's a really really important one and then i'm going to go ahead and go over each one so this is a butte not a butt it's a butte um, which is basically like a large rock column um, that sticks out of the ground um, and this can have could have started as a mesa which is our next one and then weathered down to a butte 
you can see all the deposited sediment down at the bottom and this is mostly going to be because of abrasion we don't have water or anything like that around so abrasion um depending on where they're at i guess we could also have like ice wedging that could break it apart and so here's a mesa a mesa is not a plateau mesas are much smaller than plateaus plateaus can be you know really really big like basically the texas hill country is or the is part of the edwards plateau so it's a really big area which includes like all of austin and surrounding cities and and things like stuff all everything that's kind of north of san antonio is all part of the edwards plateau a mesa is a lot smaller than that like a mesa could be the size of like memorial um mesas can eventually erode to become buttes a delta we already talked about this but you can see all the greenery here very uh, nutrient rich area uh, because of all the sediment and the nutrients that are being dropped off here An, a delta can be affected later on um, if the, a dam is built because it can stop sedi uh, sediment flow and nutrient flow a sea arch is an arch in the sea and so waves and the tides are going to be acting on it and carving it out eventually it could get more weathered and it's no longer an arch uh, it could turn into a sea stack these are sea stacks uh, they're basically large things sticking out uh, at the sea and so uh, it can be dangerous to swim around here if it, the water's really rough because then it'll knock you against the rocks uh, but these are sea stacks. We have sea stacks in Oregon in that area. Mountains, everybody knows what a mountain is. Um, mountains can be pretty cold if their elevation is high enough and we can have um, ice wedging happening there. Uh, mountains, depending on how they formed, can continue to grow. Like the Himalayan mountains are continuing to grow because that's still a convergent plate boundary. If it's a volcano, it can continue to grow but then it's gonna also continue to weather. A canyon is gonna be formed by a river. For example, the Rio Grande is formed by the Colorado River. The, the water carves out the canyon. We also have a canyon in Texas called the Santa Elena Canyon, which is um, in Big Bend National Park. I already spoke about volcanoes a little bit, which is typical of a mountain. Sand dunes are a really good example of deposition, uh, and they usually have some sort of landform right next to them that they came from. Uh, for example, like great sand dunes, uh, there's a mountain range right near them. We also have sand dunes by the beach, uh, and they're constantly moving, very dynamic, always moving, um, because they're always being blown by the wind or water. A meandering river, the word meander means that it doesn't have a direction. Uh, so this is in a really flat area and it just kind of goes back and forth because it can't figure out which is the easiest way water is lazy it wants to go the easiest way and so it'll go uh, in this case it'll go back and forth back and forth because it's not exactly sure which is the easiest way because there's not a uh, big enough of a gradient or a slope sometimes there can be flood events and it'll change the where the the river's going it'll change the flow of the river so you can see at the very top where old um bends used to be in this river um, and then sometimes sections of the river can get cut off and the water gets stuck in a certain area and depending on the shape it's it's usually called an oxbow lake and it looks like a horseshoe a natural arch kind of like a, a sea arch but this is not going to be near the sea uh, something called exfoliation happens here where the layers of the rock peel off think about exfoliating your skin um, basically you're scraping off the top layers um, and so layers of the arch can actually fall off and eventually the whole arch can collapse there's gonna be a lot of abrasion here uh, because of um, there's not usually water or anything like that around uh, so abrasion is going to be acting on these and then a barrier island which we're adding to our list a barrier island protects the mainland and uh, basically when a hurricane comes through it takes the brunt of the waves and the wind and so it's uh, protecting the mainland it's protecting the bay behind it and there's usually marsh there and that's where you know plants um, are growing and animals are having their babies there um the thing about barrier islands is that they're very dynamic and they're supposed to move all the time and this can be bad because people build their houses on it or their businesses on it and uh, also 
Um, we use them for shipping lanes and stuff like that. And so some things that people do is they will dredge or um, basically dig out um, an area to make it deeper so that ships can come through carrying cargo. Um, and then we also do what's called beach nourishment where we take that stuff, the sediment that was dredged, and we put it on the beach to make the beaches bigger because the beaches are eroding and we don't want our house to fall into the ocean. So that's a, a barrier island. So here's what you're gonna write down at the bottom in case you had a hard time seeing it. So you feel free to pause here. Now, ecoregions. Another thing that you need to know is not only that we have ecoregions or what they look like, but also how they're gonna be affected by weathering and erosion. So I'm gonna go through them um, so that you can know what's gonna happen or what's kind of happening in that area. So here, go ahead and circle what I have in yellow and um, write down the description. And then we have a section that has natural processes like what's going on in that ecoregion. And then we have a section about how humans are affecting the weathering and erosion in that ecoregion. So the Gulf Coast prairies and marshes is going to be the coastal region near the Gulf of Mexico. And this, uh, we basically have the barrier islands here. Uh, we've got dredging that's going on. Um, we've got um, sediment that's moving by either wind or water or large um, weathering events or erosion events like a hurricane. Here's the second paragraph, so feel free to, to pause here so you can fill in your blanks. And this talks a little bit about dredging and beach nourishment, which I already explained. The desert, which technically we can be considered part of this, is going to not receive very much rain, although we receive a little bit more than this. Um, one of the big things that we've done to all the ecoregions is overgrazing. We've brought in cattle, we're talking cows, sheep, um, you know, all sorts of things. And overgrazing can lead to more erosion. Um, so that's one way that we have affected uh, this ecoregion. Um, here is your middle paragraph. And then the bottom paragraph that talks a little bit about livestock and overgrazing. And then the next one, the prairie. The prairie is right between the plains, which are in the Panhandle, and then the woods, which is in East Texas. They have a very soft type of soil here, which can um, erode easily. Same thing with overgrazing um, that has happened in this area. And um, one way that we've affected it is clear cutting or deforestation. We take away the vegetation and then the vegetation doesn't have, um, it's not holding on to the soil anymore and so then it weathers away. The woodland, which is in East Texas, is flat and fertile, lots of trees there. Um, the forests are actually gonna hold all of the soil in place. So um, there's not gonna be very much runoff during floods or anything like that. Uh, so it's pretty protected as long as we leave the trees intact. Uh, but deforestation has led to more erosion because the soil is not being held together anymore by those plants. And then the plateau, which is the Edwards Plateau, known as the Texas Hill Country. This is probably one of my favorite eagle regions in terms of weathering because this is where we're going to find caves. Uh, they have limestone here, so we're going to have lots of caves that form here. And uh, we've also overgrazed it, so that can lead to more weathering and erosion. The plains um, is going to be mostly grasslands, but over time we have suppressed fire, which means we don't let it burn, which has led to the growth of more brush and trees. Um, so that can change how things weather and erode there. And uh, climate change has been a problem here because it's warmer and there's more drought and 
that leads to it being difficult for us to grow plants, which is bad because this is kind of where we grow all of our crops in Texas or a lot of our crops in Texas. Okay, so that concludes our weathering, erosion, and deposition notes. If you have any questions, please let me know. Remember to find an example of this and take a picture of it and send it to me. Okay, let me know if you have any questions. I'll see you guys in class.